So I'd like to welcome everyone to our Mishmatic webinar on inquiry-based learning from John Oakes. Um, John Oakes is a professor of mathematics at Macomb Community College in Warren, Michigan. In addition, he is currently the AMATIC Midwest Vice President, TODOS Mathematics for All website coordinator, and Korean American Adoptee Adoptive Family Network CON website coordinator. John is an advocate for equity and high quality mathematics education for all students. He took a sabbatical during the fall 2019 semester to start his current project, Everyday Math for Everyday People, which he hopes will help students realize that mathematics is for everyone and that you don't have to be a genius to do mathematics. You can follow along with his project on Instagram or by visiting his website at www.johnoaks.com. So I'm gonna turn it over to John. I uh, think, thank you, Mike. So now let's see, I, I will say that to, oh no, I can't click there. So, you know what, I, I did put the, I had the, the instructor version of, of this slide deck and the uh, student version up at, at one point, but since this is a, a workshop for instructors, I, I wanted you to see what the instructor would see on, on the, the slides. And that would be this here. And then what the student would see on the slide, which is an area to enter their, their answer. And so, the the student can't actually go back which is uh, helps keep them on the pace where i want them uh, to be but then also on certain slides there will be this area to enter your answer and so uh, i actually cannot see if the, if if I was trying to see if uh, either of, of you were able to to uh, view the slides on your own screens and see if there was a spot to to enter an answer or not. And, uh, and yes, oh, you were okay. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so then if if you want to try it out, then just uh, type in what do you want to know about inquiry based learning whatever you you want it well maybe not like a, whatever you want i mean if you want to know about <laughs> something that's not if you put something in the box not related to inquiry based learning then i guess that wouldn't make sense but i i do think that it, it it's nice because i i would say that the the uh, the um, instructor can see the the responses as they come in, or or show them to the the students at any time. So I'll, I'll give you a a moment to to uh, think about this, and oh, well, you know what. Mike, I, I think, uh, would you mind uh, every time somebody comes in playing the link in the chat again, please? Because I think that that's the one thing I don't like about Zoom is if mm -hmm. anyone's late or, or logs on after the start time, then the, the link has to be sent in the chat again. I, I mean, I kind of understand that feature, but it's it, it, that's one of the, I think, struggles of doing all of this interaction virtually, but uh, let's see. So now I, I see there, there's one, one re response. And so you can see them as either a list or as a, a grid. So I like this, this feature of the uh, this program here. So it's called Pear Deck if you've never used it before. The only bad thing is if you want the 
the students to not have to log in with the an Outlook or an a Gmail email address, then you have to have the students remain anonymous. So then there's a bit of a problem in that if you want to know which student may have, say, I said a certain response or something like that after the class. So you can see the, the questions in real time. That's really nice. Yes, I and, and actually I, I like this, I really do like this program. So one thing that I, I do in terms of, of uh, gauging my, my classes using this pair deck is I can, uh, I can actually do something like this. So, I'm going to do this. So if you think that this is a, a, a good program to, to use and you think that you would maybe use the interactivity features with your, your students to see how they're doing, then uh, drag your uh, dot over to the, uh, over to the, um, the green, yeah, the, the check mark, uh, the green thumbs up or otherwise to the red uh, thumbs down. And so I, I, I'll i tell you that one thing that I, I like about this is I can actually add these extra slides in as I, I go without having to stop the PowerPoint presentation to add it in. So this is as smooth as it, it can get for a, a seamless, like, do I want to really see how students are, are doing right now so I I can I get to those those real questions of how do I make sure that that students are answering questions well all right well if, if I don't know if they're following along or if I even suspect that they might not be following along I'm going to put this up here and if I see after class that they weren't dragging their dot over to the, uh, when I asked a question, then they're not getting the participation point for the, the class. <clears throat> so that's one way that I do it. And then one of the, the IBL strategies that I, I would use is asking these questions and checks throughout class. And then uh, how does IBL support critical thinking and content retention from one math class to the next? I, I, I will say that uh, one thing that we'll, we'll talk about, not necessarily today as in depth, but at the next week's sessions are about the, the growth mindset. And so I, I, think that IBL really does foster the idea of growth mindset and as students actually feel more confident in in their abilities then they're going to do better in that class in the next class and the next class after that so I I think that this is uh, all sort of a, a lot of stuff that blends together and so we're going to to unpack it like one little tidbit at a time. So I'll say that I personally wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the Academy of Inquiry-Based Learning, the AIBL, because a couple of years ago, I went on a sabbatical from my college, uh, Macomb Community College. And then one of the things that they let me do as part of the sabbatical is attend a summer workshop from the Academy of Inquiry-Based Learning. And so a lot of what I, I've learned about IBL is from them in that workshop and then all of the the sort of 
community that they they have is what caused me to want to continue to to learn more and so my college actually let me create some uh, some workshops like the one today on what I learned and and uh, um, hold the workshops in conjunction with AMATIC traveling workshops and so here I am so I wouldn't be here if it weren't for uh, AIBL and my college and AMATIC so I appreciate all of the the support so what is IBL now oh no th this is one thing where I'm telling you like if I'm going to I don't know if that was how obvious that was but I just reshared the screen because I forgot to share the the sound button the first time but I will say that AIBL has a short maybe like a couple of minutes video introduction about what is IBL. And so I will, will show this video and then we'll move on from there. So let me go ahead and, oh, okay. So let me go ahead and, make the i don't want to play it on tv that, that, that would be really bad but i i do Hello, want everyone to it... this video is about the question what is ibl well, and what is you know what inquiry based learning it, apparently Let's take a look at some examples apparently so this is professor it play it on class. the tv because students it, in her it, class were now much of the time well, to make sense of the math they are learning I, I, this is a form of IBL. I'm, I'm telling you. And like, this, this is this Professor is, Jones's class. I did not. They're working to, on death. I apologize. I didn't mean to press the play on the TV button. <laughs> this is my, uh, how, how do I put it? Like, it, it, it's like the sticky finger thing, right? Uh, so I want default view and then I'll, I'll make it full screen for you. And then we'll, uh, go from here. Hello, everyone. This video is about the question, what is IBL and what is inquiry-based learning? Let's take a look at some examples. So this is Professor Chapney's class. Students in her class work in groups much of the time to make sense of the math they are learning. This is a form of IBL. And this is Professor Jones's class. They're working on definitions of different distributions and they work in small groups, and they also have whole class discussions, and these are all carefully led by Professor Jones. This is also IBL. And this is Professor Retzek's class. He has students working on proofs in class and outside of class, and the main thing that they do is they present their proofs to their classmates uh, every so often, and they do this at the front of the class, and the, cl the class gets to peer review all these proofs, so they get to see the proofs, And there's a simple answer to this. And the the so often, and they do this at the front of the class, and the cl the class gets to peer review all these proofs, so they get to see the proofs, check out the ideas, have a discussion about them, ask questions, and have this big class discussion. So this is also a form of IBL. So a natural question comes up: Why are there so many different forms of inquiry-based learning? And there's a simple answer to this, and that's that there are a wide variety of teaching environments in the United States and across the world. So things like class size, students, course topic, instructor skill or, or experience with IBL, institutional environment and other factors can impact what an IBL class can look like. So the IBL framework is broad and allows for a variety of different versions of IBL. Big Ten IBL is the idea that we have a large range of different versions of IBL 
and math instructors find their place in this big tent. Another question that comes up then is how do we know we're doing IBL or what's common among all the different forms of IBL? And so Sandra Larson and Chris Rasmussen in their paper that just came out this year in 2019, uh, wrote this paper called Eye on the, on the Prize. And they came up with four pillars of IBL. And this is something that comes out of the research uh, literature. So pillar one, deep engagement in rich mathematics. Pillar two, opportunities to collaborate. Pillar three is instructor inquiry into student thinking. And the fourth pillar is instructor focus on equity in design and facilitation in class. So these are the things that need to be there for your class to be an IBL class. And so what we've talked about in the past with the twin pillars, these are the two pillars on the left, and the research has um, presented to us that there actually are two other pillars. So there are four pillars of IBL, and that's how you know you're doing IBL, and that's what's common among all the different forms of IBL, whether you're having students presenting at the board and working in groups, or only using groups or some other variation. All right, so there's another piece that's worth mentioning about IBL is that the IBL framework is consistent with growth mindset and productive failure. And I like to use the frame of productive failure because in math, you're solving problems and that means you're gonna get stuck. And when you get stuck, you feel like, oh no, if you have a fixed mindset, I'm not making good progress on this problem when in fact, make, getting stuck, making mistakes, trying examples that do and don't work, that's what doing math is and those are the ingredients of success. So what's nice about the IBL framework is that you can intentionally teach productive failure and growth mindset within the IBL style of teaching. Anyway, so if you wanna learn more, we have our website, so please visit inquirybasedlearning.org. We have more videos, blog posts, and other resources for you. All right, so now I, I will say that, um, that this is the, the set of the, the four pillars of the I, IBL that was shown in the, in the, in the uh, video there, but this is a, little bit more of an expansion on a, a description of them that I, I got from the, the workshop that I attended where, of course, they go more in depth than a, a couple of minute video. But you can see here that some of the, the things that, that we're focused on are specifically the words in in the italic so engaging students but making sure that the engagement is in rich mathematical task and then there are regular opportunities for collaboration but that needs to be student to student and student to instructor so I, I do think that that's important that not only can uh, the, the students ask the instructor questions or, or talk to each other or work with each other, but also that the students work with each other as well. And then instructors inquiring about student thinking. So really getting at what is the, the reasoning behind a, a student's answer and getting the the student to to tell the instructor tell you what what their thought process was and then the fourth pillar which is actually the uh, the the newest pillar because there were only uh, three pillars at, at one point but a focus on on equity so now what I'm going to do is actually, oh, by the way, I, I'm going to do one of the, uh, just uh, asking who would like to share if, 
if you would like to maybe share which of the pillars is most important to you or or rank them and the importance of which one you think is is like the one that you really feel like you you think is so important that that's the one that you want to make sure that you improve on and do the the best and maybe it's the the other three pillars you know that you're already doing them in your classes but there's one that you know that you want to get better at or maybe it's that one of the pillars is one where you feel like if the one pillar is is going to be there then the other ones will have a domino effect and follow after that so what are your can i have something first oh what was the last question yeah go ahead Inda. i was thinking about the equity there can we uh well some students may be like need more help they may need more help than the other students right but what if then the students, other students see it like that the teacher treats the students differently? Ah, Do you so, understand what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so some yeah. students may need more help than others. And so uh, what if some students think that they uh, uh, are Yeah, somebody gets special treatment while they do not get that treatment. Yeah, so I, 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 and well, what are other, other thoughts on, on that, that question or any of the pillars? I have a thought on the, the equity issue. Um, so if the interaction, whatever the lesson is, is designed properly, then it won't be as obvious that somebody is getting extra support. Um, so I kind of like would design something to where everyone would have something to contribute. Um, and then I find that students help other students better. So I would kind of like set up an IBL lesson in that type of uh, way. So it is not as obvious that someone might maybe get an extra help because everybody's kind of helping each other, if that kind of makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, definitely. Uh, Mike, did you have something to say? I was going to say that in terms of those four items, I think the most important to me is number three. Mm -hmm. I think that not necessarily in terms of a math class, but just having students think about what's best for them on how to think about a certain situation or problem that they're facing may be the most, most important in terms of IBL for me is that having students think about what's what's the best way for them to think and solve problems on their own. Yes, I, and so, so I'll, I'll tell you that my, my thoughts on all of this is, uh, Shauna, you said it very well, like about the, that depending on the, the type of interaction and how it's, it's designed, then, you can make sure that every student has a, a task to do. And so then it's not as obvious that, that some students are getting uh, maybe extra help. But my thought on, on this is also that, um, you know, the, the students, if, if we give them, say, the opportunity for, for collaboration, then that's, then maybe a, a student who isn't as strong of a student will talk to one who is a, really understands what's going on and they'll help each other and as the instructor, then I don't have to necessarily do as much of that 
the interaction with the student uh, myself. And so then the, the students are less likely to realize that, hey, that student is uh, struggling and hey, that student is getting extra help from the instructor when it's less noticeable if and it helps, I think, both the students if the students have that time to collaborate. But the other thing I'll, I'll comment on is that a lot of people who use IBL methods in their classes actually use some form of mastery-based learning also. And so right now in my classes, excuse me, I, I'm not even giving any test uh, be, besides the final, but the students have to get uh, 100% on every one of the online homework assignments. And so they, I let them do them as many times as they, they want to until they get 100%. And I, I know which students it, it takes longer for, and I know which students are like, pouring their heart and soul into everything that they're doing for the class, but they feel a lot better at, at the end because it's, it's the first time a lot of them have ever gotten hundred percent on any math assignment in their life. And so I, I want them to, like, I tell them, like, I don't really care about what your answer is. I want to know what you're thinking about because that's how you're going to get the hundred percent is when I, I know that you have shown me that you understand the thought process behind the, the problem. Like it, and even on the, if it's a web assign problem it, or, a, or a, my math lab problem, or what else am I using? I, all my classes are using some form of, of uh, homework online. And if, the, the student actually uploads their work and tells me what, what their thought process was. If it was just, I can tell they missed a negative, then that's what threw off their answer. I usually just circle it on their paper and send it back and tell them, type this in, you knew what you were doing uh, and try to pay more attention to your negatives later on because I don't really see a point in actually uh, having students like struggle with that, that sort of, uh, of issue when that's not really a mathematical task, right? I mean, because if, if we go back to pillar one, like is searching for a negative in your work so that you can get the online homework system to accept your answer really a rich mathematical task? Absolutely not. So. I, this is how I think all of these pillars in, in that way are intertwined, going back from, well, it starts with the equitably uh, designed activities and then giving the students the chance to collaborate on those, but then focusing on what is the students thinking in that process, but at the same time, making sure that overarching all of that is that they are involved in rich mathematical tasks called at all times. So I, I think that all four of these pillars are, are equally important in that way. But I, oh, does anyone have any other comments about any of that or? or? Well, I, I find that number three and number two kind of like helps everything else fall in line too. Um, because I have found that I have a hard time figuring out what the disconnect is, especially when it's a large number of students getting the same things wrong, right? But if I just simply ask, why did you choose to do that over doing something different? Um, I have often found that they're applying definitions wrong or applying strategies where it takes me all of five minutes to correct that and then all of the grades just shoot back up. But if I don't ask the question and I don't have that interaction with them, then I'll never know. And then it's just, it's just a snowball effect, right? And then the rest of the semester is just like gonna crash. So um, I'm a big question asker. I do not, I like for students to tell me why you chose to do that um, because it helps me kind of gear 
what I have to say next or what I might need to, to reteach or what I just need to quickly show, something like that. So I think it's really important for the, for the instructor to, to, to interact with the students just to figure out what the thought processes are. Um, one, you wanna get the students thinking correctly, but two, I need to know what you're thinking to figure out where the disconnects may be. Yep, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I want to say something, that, oh, I'm going to clear this. I always forget to do that. This is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the same four pillars, but represented as a two by two grid. And so this isn't, I, I found as common of a diagram, but I think it's, it's a, a helpful diagram because it's talking about the, in, the, the students' needs and what the instructors uh, must do in a mathematical space, but, but also in a, a social space. And so I, I think that, uh, like you mentioned earlier, something that I, I thought was very insightful that it uh, that you asked or said something about uh, having a student think about what's best for them within a certain problem or any other situation that they're facing. And so uh, the, the skills that we are, are working with here aren't necessarily skills that they're just going to use on on the mathematical problems, but maybe on other other problems that they might face outside of class or in their their general lives outside of class. And so, if we can get the the students to to incorporate the problem solving techniques that that they might be using, say, to play a video game or like like something, if we can think like MacGyver, like get the students to think like MacGyver and come up with ideas and situations all the time, then that's, that's a win, I think. So what I, I want you all to do, and hopefully you can do this, but if you go up to the, the, view options at the top of your screen, you should have the annotation tool. And what I would like you all to do is take a, a, a moment or two and then think about this two by two grid and the four pillars and then put down like next to each of the four pillars, something that you see as a, a strategy that, that, that uh, goes in that cell of the grid or even a comment about it. So maybe uh, I'll give you one to start with just so that you, can maybe see what I, I mean, but when I say opportunities to collaborate, I might do the think, pair, share strategy where students have time to think about a problem, they, they pair up and talk about it, and then the, that pair of students shares out their, their responses, and that would be an opportunity for the students to uh, collaborate. So I, I want to give you all a minute to think about this grid and then maybe uh, type something in or write something in at, at least two of the four cells so that you think is a, a strategy or a technique that would go along with that cell. So I'll mute myself and, and give you a minute to, to think.
All right. So if you, if you have any last thoughts only like you have the timer there for about 20 or so more, more seconds. All right, there, there we go. So the, 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 the timer is gone off. All right, so, so these are all, uh, yeah, these are all great uh, deep engagement in rich mathematics. So there, uh, one suggestion or comment was a journal where students explain and take steps to solve one problem I assigned. So, I I think that a couple of things that that you might want to to add is they the, the students need time like extended amounts of time to otherwise they're not going to get that deep engagement so they have to be given time to actually think about the the problem so so engagement in task for extended uh, periods of time so if you're moving along too too quickly then i i think that that the, the students just aren't going to have that chance to really digest everything and get that deep engagement that that you're looking for. It, another thing I I might add is maybe uh, maybe just making sure that they are are tasked that the sort of I'm gonna put require in quotes but require a group effort because if it's something that's simple enough that they can answer on their own then then they're not going to get that the uh, as deep of a engagement if like if the students are able to answer on their own or do a project on their own without asking for help or like collaborating, then it, it probably isn't engaging them as deep as you might might think it is. And then also maybe something to consider is that th there you give some low floor and high ceiling uh, high ceiling task, right? So that the the students feel like they, have the ability to to engage in the mathematics without having a penalty for it. So I think that that's again why I I kind of have, have started going toward that mastery based learning so that students feel like they I've invited them in to uh, be able to engage with the mathematics without penalty. So does anyone have any questions or anything to add to that? that first so that's going to create some overlap then with the, the bottom um, right corner because if they um want to um feel like they can share or uh, reach out uh for the deep engagement they have to feel like the space is safe for them to do that so it'll be okay if i make a statement and it's the wrong statement that somebody will respond respectfully to me when i when i do that otherwise i won't engage that way Does that kind of makes sense yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. So if, if I didn't capture that right, I I, I think uh, uh, just let me know by or type it out there. But I yeah, I, I I think there's a lot of overlap with a lot of these. And. Um, let's see, let's move on to the the opportunities to. Collaborate. Here, so now 
So it's a lot of the students to collaborate with me on some lesson planning, project-based learning, low stakes assessment. Um, I'm thinking things along the, the line that we, we want to, I, I want to state this ag again, that the, the collaboration of student, student and student instructor so that the, the students have, have both types of, of collaboration. But then also, this one wasn't really on there, but the opportunity to uh, collaborate with the material, like just the the time to that that opportunity to say, well, all right, I'm going to collaborate with the material and take the ideas that were in the reading and have the time to gather my thoughts and and put it all together. So I. I do think that, uh, of course, things like uh, the group work that a lot of us uh, definitely do already will uh, be in that that space also. So does anyone have any other thoughts or comments about this corner here? I found when I had them, it's kind of like tying together where you said to collaborate with the material and then kind of collaborate with me. So I'm the one that put the collaborate with me on the lesson planning um, that when I decide, you know, I'm like, well, I have to assess your mastery on this. Um, and I open it up to the class. How should I do this? Right, we have this option, that option. And I found that when I uh, do that, because I really, it doesn't matter to me. Like I can assess many different ways. I don't care. Um, but I found that when I let them tell me what they think the best way to do that would be, that they took more ownership and took the assignment to be more serious. I think we ended up doing like a, a massive group wiki project is what they came up with for a, a for a study guide or something that we ended up doing for their final exam or something. But like they, they took it seriously when I let them um, kind of like help me decide how we're gonna, how I'm gonna educate you since, you know, it's your education. So um, I found that if they, you know, feel like they have more ownership in their own education, like they, they, they really like feel motivated to, to, to engage and to seriously collaborate with each other and with me, if that kind of makes sense. <laughs> oh yes, and, and actually I added that down here to uh, foster an equitable environment because if students don't have those opportunities to take the ownership, it's not an equitable environment because I, like students, I, I've realized that every student comes into our classes with a different background and some of them might have a bit like the, be mathematically prepared for the class and some of them might not and and they all went to different high schools and, and some have been out of college for a while. Some are, are right into college. And so I, I, I don't think that just assuming that a student has met the prerequisite even for a class is enough to, to say, well, everyone's on a playing a field that's level. It's absolutely not the case. So, um, but Shauna, you made me think of something else that I, I've been doing. And this semester, I started doing a weekly self-assessment. And so I have students enter like six questions in, in Canvas and they, they submit it as a, as a quiz. But it, it's things like, tell me two words that describe your effort in the class this week or tell me like one goal that you have for yourself for this week, whether it's a goal for this class or not, but a goal that you have and why it's important to you. And then tell me one new thing you learned this week and why it was important to you. And, and I, I guess that kind now that I think about, I was trying to think of which box that would go into, but probably the and inquire into student thinking because I want to know what their thoughts are about the material and about 
what they learned this week, but then I, I leave a box that says, is there anything else you want me to, to know? And I'm telling you, like, I've, th this semester I've learned so much. It's been things like, I really like that, that example of the, like that real world example, whatever it was that you, that you did. Can you do more application problems in class? Or another one said, oh, well, I really liked when, like when you do the polling questions, because I know if I have the answers right before I go and do the homework, and I'm like, okay, I can do more polling questions. <laughs> like, I mean, if these are the things that they want, then at least, like, I, I think it's really hard, especially in the virtual world that we're all like maybe sitting behind our computers. And, and since we can't see everything as well, that we miss a lot more. And I, and I realized you just have to ask. So if you ask the students, they're going to tell you. So so I think that's one thing is just like start by asking, asking uh, students what they think. So I see that the self-reflection each week it, it was already there and the goal setting. That's it. Like, like I said, the doing a, a weekly self-assessment was is, I, I think, a, a great thing. Uh, I, I know that I mentioned the polling, the class. And then we we could have a a whole class sort of uh, maybe I guess uh, discussion or maybe a, a moderated discussion whatever works the the best and then then looking at the the student submissions as evidence of, of thinking and not only for assessment. So looking uh, uh, at student work for evidence of thinking and not only for assessment. And I'll tell you that I have my, my students uh, do, like if I, I usually have them write like a paragraph or something at some point in every semester that they have to turn in for an assignment and it ends up being something where they they have to do a rough draft and have it edit it at least once and go to the reading writing center if they need to and and I, I think that then I get a better idea of what they're actually um uh, thinking and what their motive behind certain uh, things were. So are there any thoughts about that, uh, Sol? So, yeah, when you also ask them what they're thinking now, it, it kind of lets them know that you care. So if you're just being lectured at, then you feel like you're just a button seat. But if the instructor actually asked you what your thoughts are, regardless of what it's about, then they, they feel more comfortable. Um, so, and then again, taking more ownership. So it, it, inquiring into their thinking um, has multiple like benefits. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Mike or Inda, do you have anything to, to add to any of these cells that we've had so far? Just the, the, um, in, the inquiry into student thinking. One thing I'm doing this, this entire year because everything's virtual or online is that I, I, I need to be able to figure out what what is going on with students? What, how are they feeling each week or how they're feeling each day? So I've been having those weekly, a weekly self-reflection on not just mathematics, but just what's, what's going on in your life right now that, that is impacting your learning or actually is excelling your learning. So I just wanna, I wanna be able to figure that out each week. And that's something that was, that's missing this year. Yeah, yes, I, I absolutely. Enda, did you uh, have anything you'd like to share too? Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was thinking about my classes. In my classes, uh, only some of the students that are really active in talking, the rest, they were just like, 
watching the other classmates doing the discussion. And even though I call their names and I told them, okay, you can say whatever you like. There is no punishment if you make a mistake and there is point for participating, but they always told me that they just don't feel confidence in talking and they would like to just prefer listening. And I said, okay, but make sure that you can chip in any time because whenever I wait for them, then they just do not say anything. So I was thinking like, how do we make them all talking? So I don't know, where can we put it so that they can feel comfortable enough because the, the rest of the students, they're, nobody's judging anybody and they just talk and sometimes they make mistakes, but the other half of the students, they just do not say anything really from the beginning until the end. They just being there. So how, how, to, how to put them into... Some students to, actually have trauma from participating and being demeaned in other courses, even going back as far as elementary school. So they're not going to talk. Um, for some students, it might actually be damaging to force them to talk. Yeah. Uh, what I do is, is if I, I will ask them outside of class, usually via email or whatever, um, um, is there a reason why you're not participating? And if they say they're not comfortable, then I come up with a middle ground. Can you send me a private chat so I know what you're thinking and that way only I can see it. Um, and then I was like, and then, you know, if they do that, I'll ask permission if it's really good. Can I just share anonymously what you said? And so they get the, the, the comfort of knowing that what they had to contribute was good enough, but not without having the spotlight right on them, if that kind of makes sense. Like they feel good, like, oh, I shared that. Even yeah. if she it was me, I know it was me. Um, so I, I kind of have to fill it out student by student note because I don't, I never want to cause more damage than good. Um, so, you know, usually for me though, that private chat is what has been working out or, you know, send me an email. I'm checking my email while I'm teaching and, and, and that'll kind of like help some students. Well, I did that as well. So I told them, you can just send me the chat and I will, read your question or your whatever you say that. But yeah, some of them just didn't feel that confident. So it's kind of heartbreaking for me. Yeah, so I, I think that that's one of the things that I, I think everything that we're I, I, like um, building confidence and uh, I was going to add something else down to this foster an equitable environment box also, but something about like giving, uh, uh, giving or ensuring uh, students have time to think like, because sometimes like I think that I, I've, I've actually found that some students, if they're, they're given the time to, to think then, then they might be a little bit more willing to uh, to speak. Also, I so even when I I do say the the cahoots, I I do give the the students the the problems all in advance, even if it's like ten minutes in advance. And then the I have the students work on the the problems in the in small groups and then at, at that time we do the the kahoot and then some of the students who might normally have been one of the last students to answer are now some of the first because they know that they have their answer right because they talked over with their group so it, it kind of made it it did make it makes it more equitable for the students who maybe didn't come into the class having that background it, and it might not even be mathematical background that they don't have it might be the they didn't have the background of of coming from an environment where it was okay to make a contribution in the past so i think that those are all going back to the idea of that past trauma also so are there any thoughts on anything else before we move on? I have a random thought. Like, um, I like all of these strategies, but I never like box myself into any one strategy. I feel like every semester, every class, every student is different. 
So what I try to do is I try to be as flexible as I can, because I think it's easier for me to change my ways than it is for me to have the students kind of change their ways just to create a safe environment. And I also let them know of all the struggles I had uh, in math too. They, if you teach math, they just think that you are a natural genius and that's not true, so. <clears throat> Actually, Sean, I, I, I really like what you said there because it, it exactly, like it exactly like leads into the, the next slide. So, so it is, I don't know why this is, <laughs> there, there it is. So yeah, the next slide is that just saying that every semester doesn't have to be the same and that there there's like many varieties of IBL and there's, and depending on the, the students in the class or even an individual student that we're working with, we might use a, a different technique. And so that might be the whole class discussion. If you have a, a, a group of students all together that, that that's the best technique for practicing problems and having a, a chance to talk about them with each other and things that, that they're struggling on with the problems or, or coming up with definitions or think pair share or, or doing some proofs of, of some items so that, that students can see the, the nuts and bolts behind what's going on. At least some of the time I found that was useful. Um, this upcoming week, I, I'm actually having my uh, differential equations class give presentation. So I, you know, and actually they, they I kind of sprung a, a, on them because we just had spring break. So the day after spring break, I said a week from today, you're giving a presentation and it will be worth five times the amount of all of, uh, what a normal homework assignment is. <laughs> so so I, I, I think that, you know what, like I, I, I told them, you know, you know what, like, it, here was the thing I, I told them, but if you incorporate something in, into your presentation that is a, a connection to uh, this class and, and how you would use it in everyday life, then that's an automatic five points extra credit added onto your, your project. And so even though it's worth five times the normal assignment, you know, like if they, they make a, a small mistake, if they, they, they I, I want them all to know that I value that their uh, previous experiences and in, in bringing them into the class and, and explaining in their presentation, like why the, the problem they picked to present about really matters to them. And, and, and just giving them that chance to share, it, I think is important. I already have one student email me and said, I, I really like this uh, project because I, I'm working on this, this uh, like he, he said something about, oh, some circuits at, at work because he works as a technician somewhere. And he said, he's going to gather some real life data from his work with the circuits at his, at his job and incorporate that in the project. So I'm like, well, he probably wouldn't have ever thought to connect that information to the class if I wouldn't have given the opportunity to do that. So, uh, and then reflective writing and, and group work. So now I, I'll say that a lot of times that we, we talk about IBL, you'll hear the, the phrase, the big tent, but the big umbrella is the same idea. There's lots of, of things that can, can fall under this, uh, uh, the idea of IBL. So what I, I want you all to do now is take a, a couple of minutes and write on the, the screen, like some other strategies that you do to already in your classes that 
uh, relate to the four pillars of IBL or 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 um, just incorporating inquiry into your your classes. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that, and then we'll we'll go over uh, what everyone's uh, shared out there. So I'll be quiet to let you think now. So, um, John, you want us just to type on the screen some strategies that we're currently using or just think about it? Uh, no, yeah, type on the screen some strategies that you're, you're currently using, yeah, that fall under the idea of IBL that aren't already up there, I guess. How do you write it? Oh, it's the at the top of like uh, of the screen. There's something. Oh, the, the blue options. one. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's see. Let's uh, go ahead and, and if you maybe didn't uh, have time or, or uh, maybe if you thought of something that you want to add, uh, uh, we'll go around and just have everyone uh, share uh, something that, that maybe even they see up here that they hadn't thought of before or something that they still want to add or anything that you want to comment on. So Mike, uh, why don't you go first? Okay, so I think I already mentioned this before a little bit, but each week I'm having students submit uh, self-reflection this semester, this entire year. So students tell me what, what topics may were fun for them or that they enjoyed or some topics that they felt that they need more support on. Um, so that's what I'm doing this semester. And then I'm also, I've always done, I've done this for several years now, but I've given quizzes, but the quizzes don't count for very many points. So they're very low stakes for the students. They don't feel like the quizzes are as much as, as an exam as the importance is. So I have students have take home quizzes and then they're allowed or encouraged to work together on the quizzes. So I, and since I'm teaching online, I'm having students I'm having a discussion board each week where students can actually contribute and help one another into the discussion board on each take home quiz. Oh yeah, I, I like that, that they, so uh, I think that, I, yeah, I like that. I, I think that one thing that then we, I like, us to capture is that the use of discussion forums and 
and uh you know like I, I think that that's good the one thing that I, I don't think is necessarily captured on here is that this can be asynchronous uh, or synchronous right so that we we could have the students collaborating in in real time or or not and so I think that that's all important. Uh, Enda, uh, uh, would you like to share next? Uh, uh, I have this weekly discussion talks that I post on Canvas. So I have problems there and the students need to answer and then they have to check other people's answer and they have to correct each other. So I'm, I'm usually wait, I'm usually waiting until the end when the due date is passed to comment on what they are working on, unless everybody's making the same mistake. And I allow them to correct their answers as many times as they like. And usually if they make any correction whatsoever, they are going to get full points because I, prefer them to learn from the mistakes there. And it was going really, really nice because then they look at others and say, how, how is your answer different from mine? I don't understand, how do you get that? And then the students try to explain what they get. And I think it's a good thing that I will try to keep on having even though we are going back to the on-ground classes. <clears throat> Yeah, I, yeah, I, thank you. And uh, Shauna, how about uh, uh, you? What would you like to share? So currently in my current position, I'm not in the classroom, uh, but my job is to support the students uh, in their math course courses. Um, and so I have the time and opportunities to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. And for some of them, um, they don't put in any efforts just because they don't see the point. Um, so they think that the course is a checkbox for their degree program. So I will ask them, why do you think this is important? Let's tie what you're doing. And sometimes I have to do it for the full course. Sometimes it's just for the topic that they're working on. Why do you think this is important for you to know and what your personal goals are or your career goals? Um, and <clears throat> I find that once I do that, that the motivation and the um, kind of kicks in and then they're more, um, they work better with their instructors and their work groups um, when I can kind of do that. So. <clears throat> so it's more of an inquiry as to, to why all of this is necessary. <laughs> uh, so rather than a specific problem or so, so. <clears throat> oh, actually I, I like that and actually my, <laughs> I, I got roped into a, a, a grant at, at my college this this week and I, I, I really you know like I I, I want it I, I said no originally and then I I said no again and then it, they it came back and it's like it's due next Friday are you willing to to, to, to help and so I'm like uh, all right I, I, I guess so but we're going to start a, hopefully if we get the grant a math, center where where students can come in and talk about the the uh, study skills and the the math anxiety skills in one-on-one -on -one sessions with a, an instructor or a certified tutor and mm -hmm. not necessarily focus on the on the content but on like what can I do to get through my math class and because a lot of the students haven't had anyone take the I, like take them and sit them down and tell them like these are the test taking strategies or these are things like that you should ask yourself when you want to learn something more about a topic or like there's a KW HLQ chart that I I use for my classes like uh, um, you know, what do you know? What do you want to know, et cetera, before we start every new uh, topic, especially in my stats classes where there's a lot of new topics. But uh, I, I was going to 
I just say a, a few other examples that I have a, a list of here, but it's, I, I know that we had, like, we didn't really, on a previous page, there was something about like project-based learning. So that would be under this, uh, like a, a subset of under this umbrella here, or maybe if you have the students conduct interviews and I've had them do that too. Or if you have students uh, create and administer uh, surveys, because I, I found out that, you know, like some students will come to me and say, well, this is, this is so easy. Like everyone has to, to know this. And I'm like, well, okay, why don't you do a survey of like some of your, your friends and family and ask and, and they do it. And I, it, then they, they realize, Hey, it maybe isn't as easy for everyone as I thought, which I, I think that really helps because then they, aren't saying that in class where students who are struggling here, hey, that was so easy. Yeah, it's easy for everyone. I don't really want them saying that in class. I want them thinking like, hey, it might be difficult for some people. I want to be aware of that and, and make it a, a safer space for people who are struggling to be able to speak up. So I, I found out that sometimes just like having students like ask like, Hey, is this like uh, what survey people like? What do you know about this topic? Or if they uh, construct, make the students construct their own graphs and ask them like, what would be the best graph for for a certain situation? Or how are you going to represent what you just learned in a in a table to convey what you just learned to somebody else? Like getting them to like show their thinking by by constructing a graph or maybe even doing a simulation or a role playing. I've had them uh, do that sort of thing before and the, the list can go on and on and on. But I, I think that Shauna, you said it earlier, like the, the best thing to keep in mind is always just remember that every group of students something different will work for them and so having all of these techniques under this umbrella isn't you know isn't a, a bad thing so all right now I, I don't want to cut anyone off but I, I know that we're, we're supposed to have a 20 minute break soon so I want to at least like uh, wrap up this first part just so that we can have all a, a stretching break and, and whatnot, but I, I don't know why this is not letting me move to the, the next slide. This is bizarre. All right, so then in, in the slides, I'll make sure to send a copy around that you can actually download and everything, but there, there's some research here that was shared at the IBL workshop I attended and I thought that it would be helpful to share it here about um, about why IBL is in important in in some of the research behind it so so then in in summary I, I just want you to remember all of these things that yes IBL is doable because you you're already doing a lot of the things that are are components of IBL and IBL should be fun and allow for incremental change so I, the biggest thing i'd say is don't think that that you would be able to say convert an entire class to IBL methods overnight maybe just do a lesson a semester even or or one new technique a, a semester and then we'll talk about the growth mindset in future sessions and overall just uh, remember that IBL can be 
uh, transformative. So here are some resources. I, I know I mentioned the, the AIBL, but there's also the Mathematics Learning by Inquiry website. And I went to the National IBL Conference in 2019. And the first one I think was in 2018, but I went in 2019. And of course, 2020 didn't occur. And I don't think 2021 will occur either because I haven't heard anything about it. But then there's the uh, Commit Network and the Alliance for Michigan IBL, which I I know that Shauna, you're a part of, right? Yeah, and, and Mike, are you a part of it? Inda, have you heard of all uh, of of the, the, this one or any of them, Inda? Nope. Okay. Well, in any case. You know, like I, I would say that I start from any of them. And, and honestly, like I'm pretty sure that if you go to any of the four websites, there will be a, you'll, you'll link your way through to, to all of them at some point because they're, they're all connected and, and everyone in the IBL world knows about each other. And, and this is just, I, I think I, I, I'm happy to use today to get some of the word out about IBL.